Good day to everyone. Welcome to this edition of the DigiEdu Hack Learning Opportunities webinar. I'm Krzysztof Fenyvesi. I'm a researcher in Tallinn University. I'm joined uh, by my esteemed colleague, Janika Leoste. Janika, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Krista. Hello, everyone. I'm Janika Leoste, an associate professor of education robotics here at Tallinn University, Estonia. And we are both thrilled to be your host uh, for today's insightful discussion on key enablers of digital education. Absolutely. The DigiAduHack initiative aims to foster grassroots initiations, innovation, collaboration and uh, creativity in digital education. It's a platform where students, educators and organizations can come together to solve challenges in digital education. But uh, Janika, uh, what's uh, the specific objectives of today's webinar? A great question. Uh, today's webinar has four main objectives. First, we will delve into the recommendations on digital education and training, focusing on key enabling factors. Second, we aim to encourage collaboration and sharing of best practices among various stakeholders in digital education. Those seem to be crucial areas and uh, I believe that uh, accessibility is also on topic today. Absolutely, Krista. Our third objective is to discuss how digital education can be made accessible to all learners, irrespective of their background or abilities. And we will explore how DigiEduHack can contribute to bridging the digital divide. And last but not least, uh, we have a case from Finland as well, right? Yes. Our fourth objective is to discuss the digital transformation of education using Finland as an example. Finland has been a global leader in successfully implementing digital transformation uh, for years and we will explore now how they have done it. And who are our guests uh, today? Oh my god, we have a diverse panel of experts joining us today. We have Pablo Melon, a researcher and collaboration in EU-funded projects in digital innovation. Pablo is from Spain. And Charlotte Graham, a school principal, teacher in Sweden and the author of the book Transformative Education will also be with us. And uh, we have uh, Jukka Sinnemäki, a transformative teacher uh, from Finland, and Päivi Häkkinen from the Finnish uh, Institute for Education Research. She's the vice director of the institute. So they will provide us uh, with valuable insights uh, into Finland's uh, digital education landscape too. Exactly, Krista. It's going to be an enriching discussion and we are excited to hear about all our guests. So give us a few seconds to rearrange the scene and we will welcome uh, the guests of our first segment. Thank you everyone for joining us. Stay tuned. We look forward to an engaging and fruitful discussion.
Welcome to the first segment of the DigiAdu Hack uh, Learning Opportunity Webinar. We will talk about collaboration and sharing best practices in the first part. So uh, we have Charlotte Graham, a transformative school principal and author, and Yuka Sinnemeki, an acclaimed uh, teacher uh, with us. So education uh, has been the bedrock of the future. But uh, the pandemic uh, made it clear that we are not fully digitally prepared. The European Commission, on the other hand, um, laid out a roadmap and allocated uh, 23 billion uh, for digital education. So now it's time for action and not uh, only for, for plans. And collaboration isn't just a, just a bu buzzword, but it's more like a necessity. We need a unified approach involving governments, ed tech, especially teachers who are at the front lines of the digital shift. They need uh, more than uh, resources, so we need also a community uh, to share best practices and real-world solutions. And you are really the experts uh, from the field. So. I suggest to dive into this uh, discussion. So the first question uh, goes uh, both of you. How schools can encourage relevant planning and collaboration when using digital education, digital technology in education? What's your experience uh, in general uh, about the state of the arts uh, in the field? It's open, any of you, you can start. Um, for, the, for the beginning, actually, what happened with uh, Corona, often through challenges or problems, we have to boost and come up with a solution. And I think that really boosted, uh, boosted in a positive way how, digitally, uh, how to equip digital uh, tools into education because we couldn't meet as a person. And I think there was a lot of challenges, of course, but it was also as an eye-opener for, for many that when challenges arise, how to still be engaged. And here, uh, technology was really key to keep us connected. And it was also a bottom-up movement, really. Like teachers took the authority and just did what they needed to do because nobody told them, nobody knew how to do it. So teachers and schools themselves just made it happen. So it, it seems uh, to me, sounds to me that you really had the experience of the importance of, of mm. collaboration mm. In, in the critical uh, situation. Uh, you might have also some uh, stories uh, to tell us uh, about the importance of collaboration when it comes to digital education. Well, if we think back to when uh, COVID-19 started, I remember a lot of Facebook groups and things like that just suddenly popping up where teachers collaborated uh, in the, in, within the country, but also internationally. And we've learned a lot since then, I think. But collaboration is always important, whether it's digital or, or, or it's uh, analog. <laughs> collaboration is when the magic happens, really, I think, in, in teaching or in anything in life. So uh, you are based in Sweden, yes, right? Yeah. So uh, what was the overall uh, experience in, in Sweden regarding collaboration and sharing best practices? How, how do you see it and what uh, remain uh, with us uh, now in this post-COVID uh, era? Well, I think we have a problem still that it's not organized collaboration. It's on, it happens but it's not organized. I think we could, have, we could have learned a lot from countries that organize uh, this more so that, so that there are um, state-run platforms for sharing and things. It's more, as I said, Facebook groups or, uh, yeah, I think we could have done it better in that sense. So it's especially that kind of bottom-up yeah, uh, approach, this kind of grassroots approach, yeah. which really DigiAdu Hack uh, is, is really about yeah, to, to yeah. find that how different actors, different... Um, uh, key uh, people and key communities yes. from the field can find the way to collaborate mm. and uh, try to find this transformative yeah. uh, change uh, bring forward together. But it's the same with AI now. Uh, there's no one telling us how to use it. We have to, everyone has to sort of reinvent the wheel now to work out how to use AI in education when that comes. And, and uh, everyone, <laughs> the, the uh, authorities or the, the experts or should be experts, 
they're sort of a bit behind because we have to deal with it on the floor straight away. We can't wait two years while they have an investigation. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Uh, AI is a, is a topic yeah. on its own, yeah. uh, what we need to uh, discuss uh, right here, right now. Yeah. But let's uh, take a look uh, also at uh, the situation in Finland. As uh, you know, we will have a specific section in this webinar when we talk uh, about the Finnish situation. But Jukka, can you uh, give us some insights that how do you, did you see the importance of collaboration in the COVID time and what's happening in the post-COVID time? What remain uh, from those uh, collaborative practices? Uh, how do you see this? Uh, that's definitely true that the collaboration and the unity amongst the staff was really, really strongly present. And then it, it was, a, it was proved, proved that there is so much knowledge amongst the teachers which are not often seen because you have certain kind of roles or you always invite as an expert, mainly if we talk about digitalization or technology. And through my experience, it was incredibly beautiful to see how teachers, how their talents and skills was seen, how they put them on the stage mm -hmm. and re really helped others because such uh, such uh, occasion as COVID-19 and then everything, all the connections uh, to to the parents and to the students are through in the internet and using technology. And that's for mainly for elderly people a scary thing because there's so much stuff going on and then you have to learn learn something mm -hmm. new. So this kind of supportiveness and as you say, how the post-COVID time, I do see that there was a lot of good structures what we were forced to build throughout this pandemic. And now how we still can foster, how we support, and we are not maybe so much afraid of making mistakes and making a great... Uh, even great innovations in a way. That's that's very important uh, what you mentioned about uh, mistakes because we tend we have a tendency when we talk about digital education to celebrate um, the shiny uh, new inventions and uh, talk about future opportunities. But sometimes uh, we overlook uh, that uh, what's needed uh, for all uh, to enjoy uh, those innovations and to use that technology and accessibility uh, will be also our topic. I was uh, I feel very lucky because um, I had the fortune to visit both of your uh, schools, both mm -hmm. of your institutions, and I've seen you uh, also in action. I, I, I saw you on the f on the field. I met many of your colleagues uh, and also saw you how you teach, and uh, I had the impression that uh, the cohesion around you was uh, really uh, part uh, of your everyday experience or everyday work, that you, you've been very closely uh, connected uh, to your colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. And I saw, saw that how you use technology and how many innovations appearing uh, also in your own practice, but I felt that the community around you uh, was also very important uh, from, uh, from, from this aspect. Maybe uh, you can you can share uh, some uh, stories uh, from your own practice that how you maybe introduce some new uh, technologies, new solutions, and uh, how your how your community uh, is uh, also part uh, of of your of your stories. Well, I I'm a headmaster, a, a principal, and I always visit the classes of all my teachers uh, at least twice per term or twice per year, once a term. And I see what they do and then I comment on that or we start from that. And if I see something that a colleague does differently, perhaps I will put, connect them or I might give them a book or a chapter of, or an article or just discuss with their practice with them and just start from there. Because all the teachers are different and they do different things, but, but they, they all have something to bring where we, where we can start from. And I always try and, and, and encourage and be positive and, and bring in digital solutions where that is a possibility or, or, um, or just collaborations between yeah. different teachers. As, as I hear from what you are saying, mm. um, and, and I have seen that, mm. so professional development is not like a special course, it's not like a special training occasion, but it's happening every day yeah. mm -hmm. and, and everyone 
has a word in that. So you approach uh, teachers, you encourage uh, also teachers in your school to approach each other yes. and, and support uh, each other mm -hmm. uh, in the development. So it's really a, a developing uh, community and, and like a developing system, uh, uh, the, the school uh, yeah. as it is. Mm -hmm. And Yuka, I, I've seen a lot of uh, interesting um, equipment uh, in your school, which uh, I think some ways connected uh, to you uh, and, and used by the whole school. So can, can you open it up, uh, this? Yes, I, I try to do my best. Um, we must listen more to students. And I think we learn from the COVID that we actually were forced to listen more our staff and there was time to share, but not only amongst the staff, but amongst the students as well. So I think that was kind of, in a way, time to uh, slow down a little bit. And as we all know that if you drive fast, things get blur uh, blurry. And there is many takeaways uh, from there. And during COVID time, it was really short that uh, students didn't come to school in Finland. So... I really focused on the environment and how we engage the students and the entire family to be involved more with the students' life. And when you referred for the devices and the sport equipment, uh, it had to do a lot for the kids' innovations and the idea that what makes the learning more, not just innovative and creative, but what really engages them, what, what brings them or satisfies them enough to to, uh, to um, put the, uh, get the potential out. And those, those devices, there is every device has a story behind. And, and they, if I very quickly try to explain how, how it works. So when students come with an ID, and so we don't turn them down. We invite every innovation, every idea, whether it sounds great or not in the, at the beginning. And we try it. And we tested it and we tried. And then we have some criteria. What are the benefits? What are the challenges? And then we make together a decision whether it's a keeper or not. And this is kind of what makes the, look, uh, the class look like the students. So they are very, it's inviting. And when they open the do door and enter to the classroom, everyone could see in one point that my ideas, my innovations have been taken seriously. And this is a place where I enjoy to do anything, basically. Well, what I hear from your words uh, is uh, a little bit surprising me because we tend to understand the word, uh, the concept of professional community mm -hmm. is the community of the adults, the community of the teachers. But I can hear that uh, in your professional crew, there are also the students and uh, they uh, are, uh, have the equal right to help you to evaluate uh, certain pedagogical opportunities uh, connected to certain devices and we keep uh, mentioning devices so just to be a little bit uh, more visual uh, I've seen screens huge screens uh, in your uh, school building but these screens were not meant uh, just for passively watching but I've seen activated uh, kids and teachers in front of these screens could you uh, please uh, tell about this more Yes, and we are not talking about cra crazy times. <laughs> we are talking about w what, how digitalization and technology can really help and be integrated in, in our everyday life. So we are talking about extra games. And for example, I was... Ex exercise uh, games. Uh, uh, yeah, it's called extra, extra, games. extra, extra game. But training it's, uh, yes. game. Yeah. yeah, but like the main topic is <laughs> extra game. The idea is what I used, um, I wall and run a beat like I was able to uh, motivate students to jog and run and all the movements what they did were simulated into the screen and the feedback what I received from the students that many of them felt that they haven't uh, felt exhausted for months and months and that we all know the topic of well-being and how the physical activity has gone down and how important that is in terms of mental health and anything in our life. 
So this is only one way where uh, you could activate the kids to um, keep their body in shape and feel good with the technology. And this uh, other one is to engage uh, with students what wouldn't this interaction wouldn't happen without this uh, help. And just to mention to our viewers that at the same time the rest of the kids are running around uh, outside uh, in the schoolyard. So it means that the total, the whole activation of the whole school with many different uh, tools and that's how technology is uh, really a seamless part of the whole uh, school ecology uh, in this way. And Charlotte, you mentioned that you walk around and sometimes you give an article, sometimes books uh, to your um, uh, teachers, maybe also to your students, I'm sure that uh, uh, your students are connected uh, in your professional mm. community just as the same way uh, like you because and you are in the lucky position that sometimes maybe you can give your own book uh, to, to, to your yeah. colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please uh, tell a little bit uh, about this book and why did you write it and do you have something uh, in, in the technology uh, aspect uh, in this book uh, what would be worth to consider? We do, but we did write the book first of all because we had an experience as practitioners and we What's found... What's the title of the book? Uh, Sorry, transformative just to... Education. Transformative mm, education. education. This is the book uh, to yeah. look for, yeah. Charlotte Graham yeah. and... And uh, Philippe Blanchard. Yes, mm. okay, mm. thanks. Yes, and uh, Philippe is a teacher and I was a headmaster and uh, we found that there were a lot of books, uh, more like handbooks written by teachers and headmasters. Handbook, do it like this. But we didn't find a lot of writing, academic writing, which was more on a philosophical basis or, or which uh, dealt with questions of why we do what we do. So we wanted to write a book like that and, and just share our experience of, of most of all collaboration between teachers and what that can lead to. And also practical, like hands-on learning and project-based learning, you could uh, call it, or, or yeah or subject integration. Not, uh, that's what we wanted to write about and, and we couldn't really find uh, writing like that so we decided to just try to put into words what we knew and that's what we did. And, and you mentioned uh, AI already, mm -hmm. it was among <laughs> your first sentences yeah. and uh, of course uh, this is many times among our first sentences nowadays because yeah. uh, this um, um, products uh, with the generative uh, model mm. uh, really uh, blown up and uh, it turns out to be uh, maybe useful mm. on the my one hand, maybe threatening, on the other hand definitely very surprising. Yeah. Um, uh, what's, your, what's your impression uh, as, as a teacher, well, uh, just very shortly? Yeah, uh, sorry, I think that if we can I, I'm, I'm choosing not to see the negative sides, but try and see what could we use okay. it for. And I think we could use it for individualization, more individualized learning, and we could use it for to compensate. Personalization. Yeah, personalization. Yes. Uh, yes. Or actually dealing with the exact problem where the child yes. is or the youth exactly. is there. Or we could also use it to compensate for difficulties, I could see, and also for gamification of education. Those are the main points. Um, I could see as, and then because a lot of teachers, when they first realized it, they, they more saw it as a, as a threat. How can I know if the child has written this themselves? Mm -hmm. that, that was the main mm -hmm. threat. But I think we should instead see what can we use it for. Yeah. Okay, then, uh, I have a good friend uh, who is a tech guru, mm -hmm. and uh, he mentioned to me that imagine a situation, project based learning, mm -hmm. as, and AI a certain kind of AI tool or a, or a avatar is part of a project group uh, and the students yeah. have AI as a project member. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on this, uh, Jukka? How, how can you imagine that uh, there are this digital uh, character uh, in, in a school's uh, project? That's, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, personally, I don't have too much experience yet with uh, AI. I have used ChatGPT and th things like that, but we have to understand that we shouldn't be afraid of things what's happening. So I think it's better what Charlotte said that to engage and to understand and, and being behind the steering wheel, not just sitting on the back seat 
and just wondering what, what, what's happening. Mm-hmm. So I, I wouldn't say that, oh, that's something scary and we shouldn't go, go there. I think my approach to anything is let's try, let's do a lot of stuff, let's share the ideas and, and, and what, what's happening. But here what I want to say quickly is that whether we have this... Um, avatars or help of AI uh, amongst us in, in a way that there has to be a balance that not to forget the uniqueness of, of human being and uh, what we are capable of and with or without uh, AI. Yeah, I can uh, see very clearly that this balance is very important that um, we also need to be careful that this transformation, and sometimes we can call it as a, as a leap, mm. but it's not um, uh, leaving uh, behind anyone, no child, no teachers, no parents, uh, no any members of the society uh, leaving behind. And we have a smooth uh, transition and collaboration and sharing the best practices, extending the professional community. That's uh, very important. So thanks a lot uh, for your insights. And uh, now uh, we are moving uh, to another chapter, which is not less important and very well connected uh, to this chapter. We will talk about accessibility and inclusion. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, let's uh, get back uh, to to you uh, also later during this uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We ended up uh, with the questions of accessibility. We get a very interesting journey uh, through collaboration and um, sharing good practices. We have heard uh, a lot of uh, great uh, examples and and a lot of very very practical advice uh, from our colleagues. And now uh, when we uh, start uh, to discuss uh, accessibility uh, through the DG Edu hack, uh, this is really a great opportunity uh, to overcome the jargon and uh, recognize that um, when we talk about the wonders of digital education, we uh, shouldn't um, overlook that uh, this is also a world, uh, a territory where uh, many members of the society can't enter just seamlessly. And we also often forget that how much it took for us uh, to uh, become uh, like an everyday user of some some kind of technology. These are now part of our life and we often forget it, that how was it before when we've been outside. So uh, it's very important to um, ethically and also practically address uh, this this question and not uh, growing the digital divide, but uh, trying to find ways that uh, how to how to make uh, digital education uh, accessible. So uh, to introduce uh, this, uh, we have uh, excellent uh, people uh, here. Uh, we have uh, Peivi Hekkinen from the Finnish Institute for Education uh, Research uh, with us, who is a researcher also 
problems, questions uh, connected exactly uh, to the accessibility as well. And uh, we have also Pablo Melon, uh, who is running a very exciting uh, project in the uh, Rey Juan Carlos uh, University uh, in connection uh, uh, with uh, providing digital education uh, for all. So uh, let's uh, start uh, to uh, discuss uh, with uh, this, this question. So maybe first, uh, can you share uh, some examples, some experiences from your own practice, be it uh, field experience or some uh, important issues from your research, uh, which might be connected to this topic? So uh, it, this question is both of you, for both of you. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, very nice to to be here with you, so to share some experiences. And um, actually, I'm uh, I'm a lecturer in uh, Rey Juan Carlos University, and I'm specializing in uh, uh, didactics of uh, experimental sciences. And in in fact, I'm implied in a in a project that. Uh, we are working uh, in the creation of laboratories open to the community, and we are trying also to uh, use the technology and use the digital education, uh, the, the interactive uh, digital materials, to bring this education to uh, schools, to the community, to people, to families. And one of the most interesting things in, in, in this uh, project, I think, is uh, related with this accessibility. No? So we are trying to use only um, devices like a mobile or a tablet or something everybody have uh, access to in, in the, in nowadays. Um, trying to bring all the information, all uh, what they can need uh, to uh, recreate these laboratories by their own. So this uh, one of the things I, I consider important no? to to bring uh, easy, accessible materials to the people, and this is one of the the ways we can uh, fight against this uh, this digital uh, differences. No? We 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 look and we we see in the in the in the different uh, places. I see. Uh, so, Pavi, your research uh, gives a lot of insights uh, in, in connection with these uh, questions, uh, especially how teachers uh, may be uh, coping sometimes uh, with technology and how they solve problems uh, uh, in, in the digital context. Could you uh, say a few examples? Yeah, I, um, as you said, I'm a, I have a research background and I always try to keep that in mind that I lean on evidence not not just like uh, uh, declaring the joy of e-learning or educational technology, but uh, that is the perspective. But uh, what comes to the accessibility or let's say digital divide, I, uh, there could be different perspectives if we take a look at the um, the, the theme as itself. Uh, of course, in a global scale, we have uh, many challenges still in terms of even techni technological infrastructure. But uh, what I face mostly uh, around me is the, the divide between different generations, I would say. I mean, my kids, my students, young people around me, they are much, much more fluent with the particular technological skills than me. Not to even imagine the divide between these kids and, and their grandparents, let's say like that. So um, I think that, um, well, we often talk about digital natives, but uh, there's a lot of research evidence that uh, there's not such a homogeneous one group of digital natives that exists. So uh, there's variation even among young people. And this comes to the question of schooling and teachers and, and their role in uh, narrowing down this gap between uh, different students. Not all the students have a necessary, even though they might be fluent with, uh, let's say, social media, gaming and these sorts of things, but uh, they don't necessarily have the necessary skills to manage in the increasingly complex future society, for example, solving uh, complex problems together or critical reading from the internet or 
there's clear differences in these and there schools have a crucial role in, in balancing uh, this uh, or narrowing down this gap. One very important thing uh, what I have learned uh, f from your research and also uh, from the attitude uh, what you represent is that um, technology is always to be used for some purpose. So that is not the technology for itself, but the technology is to make uh, some situation easier uh, to solve, easier to access, more, more fluent. And there we need to uh, build uh, these bridges and also this, this kind of understanding. Uh, could you tell uh, some examples um, when, um, uh, for example, uh, what, what kind of recommendations uh, would you have uh, from your research understanding uh, to, to make technology more accessible? Yeah, I think uh, in the previous session uh, there was actually good points about uh, taking students with here. I mean, uh, because I clearly recognize the gap between uh, students and, and adolescents uh, free time life and, and the, the life outside school and the school. There's a gap between uh, uh, between these two worlds and uh, for example uh, mm, Many studies indicate that uh, students, for example, in Finland, learn most of the digital skills outside from school and uh, not necessarily in school. So there's, uh, there's, uh, that what makes, for example, their background, socioeconomic background and homes, or the role of homes as, as um, more important than ever. In, in, in supporting yes. supporting uh, the accessibility and uh, it, it suggests me that it's also not like uh, the formal and informal learning but um, embracing the technology and um, uh, also learn it uh, as like a culture that that mm -hmm. was the culture connected uh, to the use uh, of different technologies is it yeah yes. and <laughs> It's, uh, I think this, uh, they were also good examples from the COVID time, the pandemic time. And uh, I think that the, this gap was concretely seen. When I observed, for example, my own kids studying from home during the pandemic time, in case the teaching was uh, very, let's say, one-directed, teacher-centered, lecturing over the internet, they realized that, well, I'm not getting now what I was, I, I'm supposed to get help for solving, for example, problems. What do they then do? They establish their own shadow networks, peer mm -hmm. networks, <laughs> to harness and support their learning. And, and they have their own channels to communicate through and, and, and they ask for help, let's say, in solving math problems, for example, from their friends. So if schools are not supporting them, they find their own ways. Uh, but it, it sounds like me that uh, this Digi Edu Hack initiative is also really looking uh, for this kind of self-organized, uh, self-initiated uh, yes. impact, and uh, also that taking uh, these into the into the into the limelight, into the spotlight, and and let's learn uh, from from these kind of practices what we are already doing and how we can uh, support it uh, with a better coordination and Pablo your um, example about this lapse uh, yes. started uh, to interest me so as I understand there is this uh, lab uh, which you introduce uh, for the whole community right who, yes. who are the people uh, whom yes, you want to take take this lab yes this uh, this project uh, that is funded by by European community and um, it's a project where, where uh, three countries are collaborating, uh, Portugal, Greece and Spain. And in, in each of, it, uh, of these countries, uh, we have a research institution and also a school. And the idea is that uh, to establish a collaboration uh, between the schools and the research uh, investigation centers, that uh, is one of the things that uh, sometimes is not common no? in that uh, in that uh, kind of uh, of projects. So in this collaboration, we are l looking for uh, mm, 
laboratories based on STEM or STEM education, science, technology, engineering and maths. And uh, we're looking for uh, a good way to um, include technology and include uh, digital education, as I said, um, as a way to um, to um, engage also the students uh, to make these laboratories. Are easy, accessible laboratories are a sort in general. But the idea is that uh, they using uh, some uh, interactive tools, uh, uh, finally they can create uh, their own uh, laboratories or they can uh, use all this uh, information to make the laboratories with their parents or with the family or with uh, the neighborhood in general. Uh, so that's the way we, we are looking for uh, for that this, these laboratories. I think mm -hmm. these are the practices uh, what we need. If you uh, have an advice yes. uh, for the technology uh, creators, what would be that one advice uh, you would give in terms of accessibility? One from Pablo and one from Pavi. <laughs> Only one short advice. Yes, um, I think uh, it's important to uh, look what are the, your own abilities and your own uh, um, uh, your own uh, abilities to, to, to use technology. If you know what ki uh, one kind of tool, maybe you have to use these uh, kind of tools to bring uh, technology and to bring digital education to your, to your students. Okay. No? So if you are an, an expert using... Uh, Authenticity. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you play uh, video games, maybe you can use it okay. to bring Very this. No? Or if yeah. you use Excel in your work, yeah. You can try to bring these yeah. uh, disabilities your, to your students. You I don't see. need to know everything. Yes. You, you only need to, yes. to, to use your, yes. your own, no, your own yeah. knowledge. Okay, thank you. That's very practical. Uh, Pavi? Yeah, I would say that tech, for technology development, uh, take uh, the diversity uh, in collaboration seriously. Meaning that uh, take people with different background with you into the development teams, as well as the end users, and in this case, digital education, not only teachers, but also students. So everyone counts, and we exactly take it up uh, from the next uh, section it here, and we will talk about the digital transformation, and we will pull together all these ideas. Thank you so much, and you're welcome to follow us. Welcome back. We are talking uh, about the DigiEdu hack and we had very important um, aspects uh, already uh, discussed such as accessibility, collaboration, best practices. And now we arrive to the question of uh, digital transformation in education. It seems to be very easy uh, to talk about uh, these grand ideas, but uh, when we uh, start to take a look in specific examples, like uh, to a country, everything uh, gets a little bit uh, more concrete. And definitely uh, Finland is representing a special case uh, in this, um, in this um, opportunity because uh, we have seen that uh, education in Finland has been celebrated uh, like decades ago. However, the challenges are not less uh, in Finland uh, like in an anywhere else uh, in connection with the digital uh, transformation. So um, 
we have uh, two uh, guests uh, for uh, to discuss these questions. Uh, we continue with uh, Päivi Häkkinen uh, from the Finnish Institute for Education Research, and we will come back uh, Jukka Sinnamäki, a teacher uh, from uh, Finland. And um, I would like to ask you to open it up uh, a little bit. Uh, that uh, is the digital transformation in Finland is a smooth ride, uh, as we might expect uh, from a country uh, which is really excelling in education, or is it also like a roller coaster, ups and downs, uh, like in most of the countries, as as we can see it? So, who who wants to <laughs> jump into this? Well, first idea what came to my mind is that if there are smooth rides in school, then something is wrong. <laughs> so I would prefer the roller, roller, roller uh, coaster in that sense. Uh, when when Paivi mentioned in the previous segment that we have to engage more with the kids and how much they have energy and ideas, then what we do should refer more to the kids' kids' lifestyle. It doesn't mean that authority is missing or there is no, no a structure or we don't have a clear focus. So that's that's the life. And I think school life should, with uh, digital edu education, should represent uh, a life, uh, li lively life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Baby, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, uh, digital transformation. If I if I reflect shortly back in the history, <laughs> this is not a long history, but uh, uh, I think that we are in a good position with the technological infrastructure. We have invested a lot on that. Uh, then gradually we have been moving to the what comes to the evaluation of the effects of technology on learning and. Uh, more recently, uh, maybe uh, focus has been in a more diverse usage of technology for learning purposes. But uh, actually all the, the recent studies indicate that uh, uh, we have still a lot to do. It's uh, technological infra is good. Technology is used, let's say, in European comparison to the average degree for learning purposes in schools. But uh, what is uh, a bit even shocking is that uh, the more mature and sustainable pedagogical practices using, let's say, using technology for collaboration, collaborative learning, or for solving problems or inquiry-based learning, these kinds of practices are very rare in Finnish schools still. If we think about it more broadly, not like in Yuka's school or this kind of a lighthouse projects uh, that we easily see in the public. Yeah, th this is what uh, is very interesting uh, to me because um, what we heard uh, from Finland uh, decades long news that um, success in this, success in that, but uh, we very rarely uh, hear about that what are the everyday challenges, what are the everyday struggles uh, in the Finnish system. And I think uh, this is very important uh, learning opportunity there that to recognize that it's not uh, just an utopia of education, but there are also failures, there are also uh, those uh, situations to, to learn from. So how do you see that uh, what are those um, uh, initiations, what are those recommendations and what are those areas where Finland should really concentrate on the everyday level. So what teachers uh, need to uh, maybe uh, focus on uh, when it comes to uh, this digital uh, transition? I think the difficult question for anybody is what would I do if I wouldn't be afraid? And I think that teachers have this stigma that they have to know everything. And as Pavi very well referred before that, in many cases, in terms of digitalization, students know much more. And I think that's the area what we should focus more that how you uh, make the group as a, as a le learning group. You don't have to be uh, praised as a teacher that you have all the knowledge and you are on the top of the every every single uh, new tool what can be helpful and useful in the in the school environment so i would really 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 focus uh, to show 
and bring out the potential of every student. And I think here digitalization can, can be a great key and we have a lot of great apps and tools already in use. So it's not about the infra, it's not about the, that we wouldn't have the access to this. It's about that maybe we are still too afraid for the failures. Finland uh, has been successful uh, for many years to hold against uh, the gap uh, in the society and uh, hold against the social divide in society. However, uh, from the recent PISA results, uh, we, we can learn that uh, even in Finland, uh, these divides uh, emerged. So how you see, uh, Päivi, from the researcher's uh, point of view, that what could be the role of digital technology and opportunities in digital learning to work uh, through uh, this difficult situation. Yeah, you're exactly right that uh, all the systematically all the studies like PISA and other interna international comp comparisons, including the ones related to digital education, they indicate that this, uh, there is the, this divide is increasing. Uh, I would like to continue from Jukka's point, actually, uh, uh, that uh, what comes then to teacher's role in digital education uh, and maybe uh, narrowing this gap as well. Uh, I totally agree that students uh, should be taken with in designing the pra practices because they, they are very skillful in certain things, in many, many things, in especially uh, fluent with the uh, technology, but uh, but then what comes to the teacher's role uh, is also very important so that the pedagogical practices wouldn't be just like temporary diversion or excitement uh, with the fancy shiny technologies, but uh, it would be attempting to be like learning with understanding and a kind of activating pedagogy, which means that learning is then not made easier with the technology, but rather more difficult because you need to, to be intellectually active and consciously uh, attempt to understand things in a, in a, in a deeper level. And, and, and then we need to rethink about the added value about the, of the technology actually. And teachers, especially in Finland, they are highly educated professionals who are capable of expli explicitly thinking what kind of learning do we want to facilitate with the aid of technology. So not, for example, taking the just routinely the digital textbooks, even though they would be only digitized uh, and uh, mediating more or less traditional pedagogy, but our teachers are very um, skillful in, in, in uh, designing pedagogy, so we should also encourage them to, to, to be active. And the attitude is, of course, a crucial question here. When you mention teachers, uh, of course, uh, we're talking about many teachers, professional teachers with different professional profiles. It's not only means that which subject do they teach or which level do they teach, but also in Finland uh, there's examples that uh, the special teachers, special educators are part of every classroom because of the inclusive uh, education. Uh, Yuka, I, I seen many times you uh, working together uh, closely uh, with uh, special educators. How do you see uh, your technologies, I, I call it like that, which you introduce together with your students, with your colleagues, from the inclusivity uh, point of view. Have you made some special arrangements or you needed to rethink uh, some of this equipment uh, from the inclusivity uh, point of view? Uh, I luckily could ha have to say that um, I was a bit against this digitalization campaigns and pushing to the schools at the beginning, but my, my personality is that I'm eager to try and see, and I, I must have my own, own experience first, what's happening, and I would say every single digital tool, what I'm using and we have in our, our school, is because I had the opportunity to experience myself. And when you said that you have seen this, um, 
specialist teachers helping in the classrooms. Uh, we have in use very powerful tools uh, when this virtual uh, reality is creating a space for the small group of students to communicate. They, they are they're social and the program provides and or the virtual space provides them and it doesn't have to be authorized by, by, by a teacher. So in th this, if I understood the question right, so I can spread the class in the smaller groups and near, nearby and basically just like Charlotte said before to check, walk around and see how, how things are going. And of course there will be a time for reflection and so on. So in, in this case, uh, I have seen a lot of positivity, how students can now communicate better with the, uh, diversely with different students, because we have very heterogeneous classes. And those practices has really helped when you are in so-called normal classroom, how to communicate with from the different background, from different cultures, when you have limited uh, language skills, etc., etc. So I also would like to choose the opportunity size. Thank you so much uh, for the important insights. I think we also started to see, get another view on the, on the Finnish education, maybe a bit more realistic uh, view. And uh, your examples and your thoughts uh, were definitely uh, hold a lot of uh, opportunities to, to learn and to think more uh, in this regard. Thank you so much. Now uh, we are heading uh, towards the last uh, culmination of this uh, Digi Edu Hack uh, webinar. There will be uh, a session uh, where we invite uh, our audience who are like participants as well as we are live streamed uh, to have their questions uh, also communicated to us. I uh, started to look uh, at my um, iPad that uh, there are uh, indeed uh, quite a few uh, questions are coming in. So I, I'm really excited about this uh, upcoming part. And um, what um, was um, a little bit uh, like a takeaway for me uh, from this webinar is that uh, digital transformation is uh, really a story on the personal level as well. A story of a student, a story of a parent, a story of an ed tech uh, provider, and uh, a story of a teacher, of course. So it's not only a policy, but really uh, that uh, personal narratives are very important and personal impressions and personal feelings and also the personal opportunities uh, need to be given, need to be offered uh, through the technology and technology cannot be a limitation. Uh, so this is, this is what, I, what I have learned uh, from this webinar. So uh, now uh, we rearrange a bit the studio for the Ask Me Anything uh, session and we will welcome back all of our guests uh, on stage and we will take a look at your questions. So please uh, be active and uh, please start to interact uh, with our guests. Thank you so much.
Welcome back to the DigiEdu Hack uh, Learning Opportunities webinar. It's a very special session now because uh, we have the opportunity to ask our guests anything and you have the opportunity uh, to type uh, your questions, your comments, your insights uh, into the chat box uh, under this uh, YouTube streaming and uh, all these messages or these questions will be delivered here uh, to my uh, device and um, I will do my best uh, to discuss uh, these questions uh, with the guests in the studio. You already know who followed uh, this uh, webinar that who are our guests but uh, to go around uh, once more we have Charlotte Graham from Sweden. She's a school principal and also the author of the uh, book uh, Transformative Education. We have Jukka Sinnemäki uh, from Finland. He's a really uh, globally acclaimed uh, transformative uh, teacher with using uh, very exciting, activating uh, technologies uh, in his uh, classroom. And we have Päivi Häkkinen uh, from the Finnish Institute for Educational Research and her research is especially uh, focusing on problem solving, collaboration in the digital uh, context. And uh, we have also Pablo Melon uh, from the uh, Rey Juan Carlos uh, University in Spain. And uh, he has a very exciting uh, European Union supported project about digital labs uh, for communities uh, in, the, in the rural uh, areas. So the uh, first uh, question uh, what I uh, see appearing on my screen is uh, sounds like this. How much can we automate teaching using artificial intelligence and robotics? What is the level of human touch that needs to remain and how should it manifest? So I think this question uh, to all of you. Uh, Charlotte immediately brought in uh, the question of uh, artificial intelligence. We all have some degree of experience with this. So how you can see uh, this uh, future vision of automating teaching using AI and robotics and what's the human, human aspect, uh, what maybe needs to be preserved? Who wants to start? Well, I was thinking that uh, the AI part could be the individualized learning with but perhaps just for short uh, periods of time, maybe 10, 20 minutes, where the, each child learned exactly at the level they were. But then they also need, or child I'm talking up to, maybe age 18 really, and then they need to come together to practice collaboration. And that is the human touch and, and problem solving and critical thinking and everything you can't learn just by individually doing something. So you don't uh, believe uh, really that uh, a robot or a, or a very highly developed AI technology will take the place of a teacher? I think for very short uh, periods of time, yes. But then but not I entirely. think, no, not entirely, no. I see. Jukka, what's your opinion? I have one, definitely. Um, I believe that every child needs a safe adult. And, um, but on the other hand, I have heard that all the kids, all the students do not like their teachers. And I'm not saying that those teachers should be replaced <laughs> with, with, with robots, but I believe that it's really, really, really important teachers to understand how to create the safetyness and make this environment for the kids as safe as possible. And I think the human touch and the building the relationship is in, in the core. When it comes to uh, technology, we could have learned that lesson that what has been possible that has been at least tried. So I'm sure that uh, though uh, these technologies are not entirely capable uh, to cover all this aspect what a human teacher uh, can cover but this will be tried I'm sure or if, if it's not tried already so what's the researchers uh, point of view uh, on this kind of directions yeah I actually um, I recognized a very similar discussion going on already in 80s if we take a look backwards uh, to the history of educational technology it was about intelligent tutoring systems 
there was already AI and lively discussions about whether teachers can be replaced by the computer, by a machine. But uh, the fact was that uh, teachers have such a tremendous amount of tacit knowledge that cannot explicitly describe to the, to the computer in such a precise way that it would be helpful. And even though now we all talk about AI and especially generative AI, uh, I still believe that teachers cannot be replaced. And, uh, but there are things like uh, producing data about learning process, for example, or about collaboration process that AI can help to make transparent and that way tools for teachers to monitor actually what's going on in the classroom and, and that way also give support and, and maybe help in the future in the issues of classroom management even. What's going on in that small group at the, this time, where have they progressed and so on. These sorts of things. So I believe, let's say, more on the partnership between the learner, AI and teacher. But definitely uh, there should be a human, uh, human touch, touch and also the human which controls uh, what's exactly. happening. And especially the social, emotional and, and, and collaborative processes are, are the ones that at the moment are still better supported by the adult. Yes. human yes. <laughs> teacher. Yes. 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 And Pablo, when um, you uh, are in, in this learning lab, uh, maybe yes. some yeah. people come with high hopes. Uh, what, what's, what's, your, what's your way to cool them down? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, when, uh, when we talk about um, AI, I think uh, we have to look uh, in a different way. You know? we, we have to use this like an opportunity, not uh, like an, uh, a way of the change at uh, a new man teacher for the AI because it's not necessary. We have to uh, complement you know, the, the, the two worlds and we have to use these, uh, these new tools no? like uh, ChatGPT. Uh, I have my, my students, I know they use ChatGPT. I, I know that they are going to use ChatGPT. So what I have to do is to change my, my way of maybe uh, all, you are already uh, looking for a, a kind of uh, work uh, for, for evaluate or for assess, for assess the, the student. Maybe you have to change the way you, you make this kind of, of activities and, uh, and change the way uh, using ChatGPT as a way of uh, look for information, as a way to um, improve uh, your conversation, improve your, uh, your abilities. No? In, okay. in kind of uh, that's very interesting. Uh, you already uh, started to mention some examples that how this technology uh, might be useful. Uh, you cut out earlier that, um, as I understood, that you you, n you have not uh, experienced that uh, deeply yet uh, this technology, right? That that was the you 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 thought, but from your words, I understand that uh, you might also use uh, this technology sometimes. Yes. I'm sure that uh, Pavi also knows how it works. So not only uh, just uh, from the user perspective, but also uh, what's behind uh, the curtain or what's what's in the black box uh, we can know. And I know uh, from our conversations that that uh, you also see how your students are using. You might also uh, use it sometimes, but you also told me that you, you just can't give away the joy of writing no. to a machine because you love uh, to write. Yeah. So could you uh, please tell me some examples uh, that uh, how you use uh, this very new technology if you have some user experience or how do you see that others uh, using if you don't have the experience. So let's let's make a little round. I can tell you that uh, I, I find very useful uh, as a researcher uh, to handle like big, bigger amount of information and organize um, this information and uh, saving time uh, for me uh, uh, that uh, man, many hours uh, can be saved uh, with, with a very uh, like routine uh, works which is which is usually the most uh, boring uh, boring part uh, and and I can focus more on the creative part but uh, how, how is it in uh, your case Charlotte 
Well, I can tell you a little story. I have a, a friend of mine who's a teacher in uh, upper secondary school, so they're sort of 17, 18 year olds, and they write really long essays. Uh, and uh, she's a language teacher, and then she has to mark them. So when she marks the essays, she gives them a, a grade and she gives a short comment. You could do this next time to make it better. But then this Christmas, she had the idea of feeding all these essays into AI, uh, chat GTP, I think she used. And um, she told the AI to give personalized, very detailed feedback. To, okay. the, uh, to the students uh -huh. and they did and they had so much help from this because she could have done it but that would have taken her weeks yeah. so she could check it that there was nothing wrong with yes. the feedback yes. but, and I thought that was so useful because mm -hmm. these students had so much help from the mm -hmm. very down to each sentence or paragraph feedback mm -hmm. from so so <laughs> it, it seems that there is yeah. two ends uh, yes, of this yeah. tube that uh, not only feeding in information to get a good essay yeah. out but also feeding in an essay uh, to get a good feedback yes. uh, from that and then we can also <laughs> see from the supportive systems that uh, they are capable also to support your writing as a writer mm. not just write instead of you but 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 give you a uh, creative support. Uh, Yuka, what's, uh, what's your uh, experience? Uh, one what I could share here now is we all know that well-being is the foundation for learning. And so I, I developed a system with the, with the team that when you collect data from your own behavior, from your own physics, it becomes much more interesting. So I was using for years different activity wrists and different sensors which collected real-time information for the students and for anyone the families allowed to see. And through that information, it has to do your social uh, relationships, your uh, nutrition, your sleep. It's not that someone is controlling what you do, but it's basically laying out your life, this is how it looks like. And then the question comes to the students that do you see anything wrong and then, or what is great about it? And then we start to study, look for information. And that's kind of transformative because we wanted to focus first that how well they are before going to the uh, little details. So, so this yeah. real time information, I would say tremendously changed the behavior and the workflow of the students. This uh, sounds to me like bringing data in the classroom. Mm -hmm. When we live in the era of big data, I think uh, that's, that's really a key point also to uh, how to understand what to do uh, with this data, how we analyze uh, this data and what we make out uh, of this yeah. data. And uh, looking at my own life as a, as a big data source, that's definitely uh, very interesting. And as I understand that you use the AI to collect this information, to make uh, visible some patterns yeah. uh, from this information, and you use it uh, to have a personalized reflection opportunity uh, for activation with the, with the human uh, uh, touch uh, included. Yeah, only yeah. a short comment. The main point, what I really want to show is to make the kids think. And if there is no, you cannot stop them thinking is not happening and then learning is not happening. And to see their life, what's going on, whether it's at the length of the sleep or the recovery of the sleep or anything, that make them to reflect their own life. And then when the decision at the end of the day is with the kids, that, that is very transformative. Yeah, thank and you. Thank you. When I turn to Pavy uh, to hear her experiences uh, about uh, this kind of new technology in, in her uh, practice, then I just uh, would like to mention that this is the Ask Me Anything uh, section and you are welcome to put your comments, your questions in the chat and it will appear in my uh, device and uh, we will discuss uh, that uh, question uh, with the guests. So Pavy, uh, what's your uh, experience with these new technologies? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think that the data is one of the key issues here, also from my personal perspective, but also more generally and data literacy here. That, uh, well, as a researcher, my experiences are quite similar as you, Christoph, told at the beginning, uh, handling with uh, large amounts of data, 
research data, data about learning processes. And, and recently I have been particularly interested in AI and machine learning uh, methods in analyzing natural language data, natural language processing, which is uh, uh, one particular area within AI and machine learning. So getting grasp on what is it actually in huge amount of textual data, what is relevant, what patterns are relevant. Uh, in this case, I'm very uh, aware of what is happening there behind. The, it's not about black box system that you referred at the beginning, but I need to know exactly or at least almost exactly <laughs> what's happening, okay. how the machine learns and handles the, the data. But uh, of course, most of the experiences come from the more or, or less transparent uses of AI, meaning mobile phone, variety of recommender systems and so on that we all use nowadays and uh, are not even aware that I'm now using AI. So those are yeah. the particular interactions. And maybe this kind of awareness uh, is very yeah, important yeah. to be built and also the ethical use uh, exactly. of the technology and also the demand that these technologies are used ethically when yes. we are uh, the objects uh, of, of this. Uh, Pablo, how, how it looks like in, in, your, in your life? Uh, no, and, and now uh, thinking how, now, how, how you say now, um, one thing that I consider important is uh, Precisely the ethical use of these uh, new technologies, the new, this, this AI is uh, ChatGPT, because uh, particularly my students, uh, sometimes they um, make uh, bad uses of technology and they maybe uh, don't, uh, don't uh, make the, the reference to the original author or something. And that kind of... Uh, of of, uh, so ethic. you mean that they are che cheating, sort of? Yes, yes, I can, yeah. kind of. Just to use the, uh, the yeah, we, have, we have to look uh, to look for yes. for our students that they sometimes don't recognize that uh, oh. that kind of uh, of uh, of things as as a problem. No, they 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 only think they are looking in internet some information, but they don't realize that the, this there is a problem. No, there is a a personal uh, that, that creates that. Uh, uh, that materials. So in this case, we 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 have a problem with that kind of uh, new technologies like ChatGPT because sometimes it's very difficult to to look where is the the the, the real part and where is what the the AI creates. No, so we we don't have also I, in my in, in my opinion we don't have the the experience to. To manage this uh, this kind of uh, of problematics. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, a very exciting time, definitely, where where we are living uh, right now, and uh, many open questions. Uh, Yuka, uh, you received uh, a very interesting uh, question. Uh, but very very pra pragmatic one. Uh, it also refers uh, even to uh, maybe uh, those uh, situations. Uh, what, what what is really um, like everyday situations for for your practice? Uh, someone asked that. Um, what has been your most difficult experience in convincing your colleagues about some digital innovation? Do you remember any of these cases? And uh, if, if yes, um, what can we learn from this? Thank you, first of all, for the awesome question. <laughs> Honestly, this might sound not to be truth, but there hasn't been a critical situation and the reason for that is that um, I have been very very lucky to work in a community where I could be me. I could fail, I could come up and fail again and the community has been very supportive and uh, the transformation there hasn't been a time that I have to convince something because I don't believe this strategy anywhere. I don't, it's very slow process that an adult um, tries to convince someone to change their behavior what has been done for decades. But the transformative part has been that the, when the other teachers see the trans positive transformation amongst the students, 
that should make them think that something is happening, what they could apply and use and adapt on their own personal way. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answered for the question. But yeah. so mm -hmm. one takeaway, focus for the supportive community and, the, and be you yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Definitely, um, and also I understood that it's like a step by step, and also that um, you you try things, and it's not like introduced uh, like as a must, but but it's really experimenting uh, in in real life uh, with that. Yes, and as a Finnish teacher, that's the very positive that we have this autonomy. Of course, it has two sides, but and when I have the support from the community and from uh, from the status as a teacher, there is unlimited ways to try different things. Mm -hmm. We aim for the same, but how you get there, it's up to the teacher and up to how we create the, the uh, environment with the students. Thank you. Uh, we heard uh, quite a few information about digital transformation in Finland, but um, someone uh, is interested that how digital transformation in Spain? Uh, you mentioned there are a lot of uh, European projects uh, going on. Yes. Uh, how do you see the digital uh, situation in, in Spain? Um, yes, um, from my point of view, uh, I, I think uh, Spain now is uh, making a good, a good uh, work, uh, improving uh, digital abilities uh, be, behind, between the, the students uh, in different levels. Uh, I think there there is a very, very good, uh, uh, very good new projects um, related to uh, primary education mm -hmm. fundamentally, because it's one of the most uh, the most important uh, stages no? to start the the digital the education, the digital transformation, and um, I think we are uh, not so advanced like other countries. Maybe Estonia is a good example about uh, no? about that kind of of uh, of uses of, of of digitalization, but uh, I think. In Spain, we are now in a, in a good in a good way to 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 find you know, mm -hmm. to uh, to to, get, to give our students uh, the abilities they are going to need in the future, because yeah. it's one of the most important things. What, what they are going to do with this uh, this technology, what they are going to use it in their lives, in their works, in their in their own uh, own life. Thank you for uh, bringing into mention, uh, mentioning the primary education. Of course, uh, Yuka is, for example, also working on the primary level uh, and um, uh, Charlotte, your school also includes uh, primary uh, classes. So definitely um, when we talk about the age, that's another critical question usually, that when to introduce the technology, However, what I uh, experience that uh, technology is sort of don't wait to get introduced because technology is already there and introduction of technology is more learning about uh, what is it, but it's already there. I also heard some stories that uh, first word of a child, a baby is maybe not daddy, mommy, but Alexa. <laughs> Siri, why? Why is that? And um, I know, Charlotte, that um, uh, your colleagues are also including uh, preschool educators uh, on, in your career. You work closely, you still uh, collaborate uh, with uh, even early childhood educators. And I've seen beautiful examples that how uh, some technology also appeared uh, in these early uh, years. Uh, what's your uh, uh, point of view about this? And also, what's the situation in Sweden? Uh, in terms of uh, that when this digital technology is introduced, for example, in Sweden. We know that in Sweden there is a great tradition of early childhood education. It's a very uh, famous uh, system. So how this tradition of Swedish education and the future is sort of working out uh, in this uh, aspect? Well, I, I don't even know if I dare say it, but it's almost as if the preschool education, the early learning, is more developed in the really? digital learning and then they sort of start again so they start usually at age mm. one in preschool and then at age seven or six they start the preschool class the normal school and often 
the, the teachers start again <laughs> from the same level, so they forget everything that's happened before. So that's a bit of a shame. But I, I was, I've been thinking that wherever we decide to start teaching digitally, we should also bring in uh, the critical thinking learning. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we, because that's what they need to know if they're going to use, uh, if they're going to get the information from the whole world, they also need to know, to, to learn quite early on, maybe even from a three-year-old, that there are things that aren't true. And there are things that are true. <laughs> and yeah, critical thinking is, yeah. is a main uh, topic to bring in at the same time. So whenever you bring it in, I, I can't really say when I think, but I've seen really good examples from very young age. But bring in the critical thinking at the same time. And, and uh, yeah, uh, that's absolutely uh, true because, uh, and it's, it's, it's a technology related question mm. because uh, usually the source of information uh, where you need to implement this uh, critical thinking and very high degree yeah. and very complex level of digital, uh, there's the critical thinking is the digital technology, which, uh, if you want or not, but delivers the information. And, and you must be able uh, to find out uh, what's true and, yeah. and what's not, definitely. Um, and um, it brings me uh, to another uh, question, which is actually uh, the same that someone asked uh, also uh, from, from you, that uh, how do you see the social and emotional and creative part of uh, digital learning in, in practice, in schools and in homes and in early childhood education as well? How do you see the social, emotional and creative part of learning with, with technology? Anyone? Yeah. Can. Yeah, I, I think it's very important and uh, at least in Finland uh, there are already initiatives that uh, among pre preschool age of uh, children there are many creative practices like maker spaces mm -hmm. or AI is introduced in a way that uh, these small kids are actually teaching the machine. They are... They are adapting a kind of a technology comprehension by learning what machine learning actually is all about. And because these small children don't have any prejudices, it's very easy for them to approach a machine and try to understand how it operates and so on. So uh, more or less creative part is done in, in this kind of a, or maker spaces and computational thinking is one area where it's very fruitful to see the creative part yes. and maybe social emotional there are many options that technology can bring into let's say virtual reality mm -hmm. giving like uh, opportunities for mm -hmm. engaging into interest driven and motivating activities like you can jump back into the history or to the future or to the space or <laughs> wherever <laughs> To explore yes. the things that you couldn't otherwise do and that way you can at its best create a kind of uh, emotionally touching mm. learning situations and, and of course it's not automatically like that but also here teachers have a crucial role that it's not just temporary mm, yes. excitement without any deeper mm. goals here. As we brought in uh, the focus on the earliest uh, years. Uh, we should mention that uh, now we are sitting in Estonia, in the Tallinn University, and uh, Tallinn University actually been um, a very important uh, hub uh, for uh, early childhood uh, teacher education, teachers preparation for technology uh, implemented uh, learning uh, even in the early childhood uh, space and we can see wonderful examples, good examples when robotics for example is used uh, not to alienate uh, anyone but to be more social emotionally skilled uh, person. So, so we can see all, all of these examples and it's, uh, it's definitely uh, very, very, very good to uh, see that. So uh, how you see the uh, social and emotional uh, learning in connection uh, with technology? Uh, what Paivi said, I will continue from, from there. I think it one way to give a great opportunity to think 
the values behind because when we start to code and teach the machines for some tricks or whatever we use it and I think um, we shouldn't we shouldn't forget this kind of discussions before that when they make choices what is right what is wrong what happens as we know we have these uh, cars what drive by themselves and there are values behind how they have been coded and what kind of algorithms they have so if there is a crash coming up they there there has been a human behind who has decided in this scene how the car is going to act and I think this is what I want to address now, that when we are using such a technology, that still there are values behind, and which is really important to talk about, whether we are talking with adults or the kids, according to the age of the Definitely. people. Uh, we, we arrived to a point when we can recognize that technology is not even in a device. It's not anymore uh, like, um, like an object that we can identify, but uh, also coming to the education, we can also see those kind of games, those kind of activities, which not even require to have any kind of devices, but we can embodiedly playing with, with each other and maybe develop uh, our algorithmic thinking, our computational thinking early, uh, already from the earlier uh, ages. And uh, we know that this is called like physical computing, that uh, you uh, play uh, these games uh, and, and you recognize how algorithms work. So definitely there are a lot of opportunities around and I really hope that all these opportunities will be considered uh, by the participants of the DG Edu Hack. And uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed uh, this uh, part of our webinar. We try to bring you uh, a diverse uh, community of uh, people also in the European range, but also regarding their expertise. And we are looking forward to see you again uh, within two weeks at the DigiEdu Hack uh, Learning Opportunity webinars. And uh, I would like to say thanks uh, for our guests uh, for accepting this invitation by the Tallinn University and being here uh, with us this time. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.